Good morning, and uh, thank you to the media for covering uh, this today. I'm Lana Payne, and I'm the national president of Unifor, Canada's largest uh, private sector union. And with me today, and also speaking today, are Daniel Cluche, our Unifor's Quebec director. And of course, we also have a very special guest, Kevin Newman, award-winning journalist and news anchor for ABC, Global, CBC, Bell Media, CTV News, and W5. And thank you, Kevin, for joining us. Uh, it is very much appreciated. Unifor, as I've said, is Canada's lar largest private sector union with 315,000 members in every region of the country. Our union also represents 21,000 media and telecommunications workers at Bell and its subsidiaries. We are here today to call out Bell and BCE and to get answers on behalf of these workers. We demand to know why Bell and the BCE Board of Directors slashed 6,000 jobs in a matter of months. We demand to know why Bell and the BCE Board of Directors paid out its highest ever dividends to shareholders while axing thousands of jobs. We demand to know why Bell is moving telecommunication jobs out of Canada to low wage countries. We demand to know why Bell has decimated newsrooms and local and national news programs across this country. We are here to say loudly and clearly, shame on Bell and shame on its board of directors. On February 8th, BCE, Canada's largest telecommunications and media corporation, slashed 4,800 jobs, a staggering number by any measure. These job cuts are on top of the 1,300 jobs Bell Media axed last June. 6,000 telecommunications and media jobs in just eight months. At the same time that Bell threw workers to the curb, it also hiked payouts to shareholders. Dividends to shareholders have more than tripled in the last 20 years for a total payout of $45.8 billion. Last year alone, while cutting jobs, Bell paid out an all-time high of $3.7 billion to shareholders. And between 2020 and 2022, CEO compensation rose by a whopping 40%. Is it any wonder why workers in this country are angry? Today, BCE executives were to appear before the Canadian Heritage Committee. They postponed for the second time, refusing to be accountable for their decisions and their actions. Instead, this week, Bell will continue to hand out pink slips to Unifor members. In this round of job cuts, the majority of Unifor members losing their employment are customer service and clerical workers mostly women, axed by a BCE board of directors made up of mostly wealthy men. Like many of our members, we want to know how the board of directors came to this decision and supported this course of action to take away the livelihoods of thousands of Canadian workers while enriching executives. What BCE has done is callous enough, but we fear, we fear, there are even more job cuts coming. We are here to ask some tough questions because Bell executives and the board of directors need to be held accountable for their actions. How long did it take the BCE board of directors to decide to throw 6,000 people out of work, gut local news programs, kill renowned journalism shows like W5, and erode telecommunications service jobs in Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, and all across Canada. A day, an hour, five minutes. I want to know, did the board consider alternatives to slashing one to thousands of jobs while also qualifying for Google negotiated funds intended to actually save local news? How much time did the Bell BCE board take to consider the plan to fire thousands of workers compared to say, discussing corporate executive compensation, such as the 20% pay raise the president and CEO received in 2022 
and the 40% pay raise between 2020 and 2022? Did they make the decision to slash jobs in one breath and hike dividends and CEO pay in the very next breath? When Bell executives finally sum up the courage to appear before the Heritage Committee in Ottawa, I encourage MPs to ask these questions and many more. From our union's perspective, we believe Bell has acted shamefully. They have put inflated profits ahead of workers, ahead of the responsibilities that come with providing important services to Canadians, whether it is telecommunication services or delivering high quality local and national news. Corporations in Canada may tell you that this is business as usual to enrich their shareholders at any and all cost. They expect us as everyday Canadians to accept this behavior and become immune to it. Well, the hell with that. We should expect a lot more from a company that benefits from Canadian regulation and licensing, from government investments, and from limited competition. The very minimum we should expect are good Canadian jobs from Canadian corporations. We expect the BCE Board of Directors to honor their responsibility, not just to shareholders, but to the working people who actually make this company what it should be. That is the social contract that Bell signed on to. It's the social contract that they are failing to live up to. We expect more and we demand more. We have three very simple demands. Stop eliminating good Canadian telecommunications jobs. Stop decimating newsrooms and invest in local and national news in this country. Reduce shareholder payouts and invest in decent paying jobs and infrastructure. Telecommunications and media jobs should be good jobs in our country. And we are going to fight as a union to make sure that they are. I'd now like to invite our Quebec director, Daniel Cloutier. Merci, Lana. Merci à tous les participants. Euh, on est ici ce matin pour euh, exprimer toute notre indignation, pour dénoncer Belle et également exprimer toute notre colère euh, face à cette, ce dîner de con auquel les Canadiennes et les Canadiens sont invités depuis si longtemps. Euh, on, est, on le fait ici également à la Chambre des communes pour rappeler au gouvernement qu'il est temps euh, de réagir, de poser des questions et en obtenant les réponses, d'ajuster tous les soutiens, l'offre, subventions, crédits et etc. qu'ils offrent à Bell en fonction de leur ingratitude envers ce pays. Vous savez, Bell, ce n'est pas une compagnie qui est dans le trouble. Ce n'est pas non plus une compagnie qui fait face à sa survie. Bell, c'est une compagnie qui affiche une croissance et qui a continué d'afficher une croissance, même durant la pandémie. Cette croissance-là s'évalue et s'établit notamment parce qu'on on constate une augmentation de la clientèle. On constate une augmentation du chiffre d'affaires. On constate une augmentation du bénéfice net. On augmente également une augmentation très importante des, 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 de la part versée aux actionnaires. Et on, augmente une, on, on constate une croissance importante du salaire des dirigeants de Bell et également, on constate qu'ils font des choix qui grandissent encore la, la part des actionnaires. Euh, vous savez, lorsqu'on parle de Bell, on parle de... Euh, bon, il y a 6 000 emplois qui ont été coupés dans, les derniers, dans la dernière année, en huit mois, allant du technicien euh, installateur de câbles en passant par un conseiller en euh, service à la clientèle ou encore des vendeurs jusqu'à des journalistes euh, chevronnés. Pendant la même période, on comprend que Bell a versé 3,7 milliards de dollars à ses actionnaires dans la seule dernière année. C'est 45 milliards de dollars versés aux actionnaires depuis 2004. Les dirigeants de Bell, le président et le, les, les, les membres du, du conseil d'administration ou de, de la haute direction de Bell plutôt, dans, on parle d'une augmentation de leur rémunération de 20 en 2022 et de 40 entre 2022 
2020 et 2022, ce qui est bien, bien au-delà des 2 à 3 que les travailleuses et travailleurs de Bell ont reçu dans les mêmes années comme augmentation de salaire. Euh, donc, Bell, ce n'est pas une compagnie qui est dans le trouble. Et ses actionnaires non plus, ce n'est pas des actionnaires qui sont dans le trouble. Pourtant, ils continuent de bénéficier également des largesses des payeurs et des payeuses de taxes canadiens et canadiennes, notamment par les centaines de millions de dollars qui ont été accordés à Bell pour le déploiement du réseau de la fibre optique. Et sans compter également à ces centaines de milliers de dollars-là, tous les euh, crédits d'impôt, euh, programmes de subvention directe ou indirecte, aide de, de toutes les manières euh, qui sont versées par les provinces et par l'État fédéral en soutien à la culture et en soutien à l'information de qualité. Euh, on comprend que pendant la même période également, Bell a dépensé des centaines de millions de dollars pour racheter des actions et concentrer donc la valeur au niveau d'un nombre d'actionnaires plus petit, ce qui fait augmenter leur valeur. Donc, non seulement ils touchent des, des très gros dividendes, des dividendes qui sont en croissance constante depuis euh, une vingtaine d'années, mais en plus, on comprend que ça a un, un impact sur la valeur de la part comme telle. Donc, il y a aussi une croissance au niveau de la valeur de l'actif. Donc, dans tous les cas de figure, on parle d'une compagnie qui fait énormément d'argent. Maintenant, qu'est-ce qui explique ces décisions-là? Les décisions qu'ils prennent de sabrer dans ces 6 000 emplois-là, on le voit, ce n'est pas pour assurer la survie de l'entreprise. Ce n'est pas pour développer euh, le réseau plus qu'il l'est là, puisque c'est le gouvernement fédéral et les provinces qui investissent l'argent pour développer le réseau. La seule motivation qu'on peut voir, c'est d'enrichir les actionnaires et d'enrichir les dirigeants de Bell et, et, et le, le conseil d'administration de Bell. Il est temps que ces gens-là rendent des comptes à un moment donné. Parce que c'est quoi la limite à ça? C'est quoi la limite à ça quand on, donne, quand on coupe des milliers d'emplois et quand on affaiblit la démocratie canadienne? Parce que ça aussi, c'est en, en filigrane. En euh, enlevant les nouvelles régionales, en sabrant dans euh, les, les salles de nouvelles, en diminuant le nombre de journalistes qui peuvent sur le terrain, on diminue fortement la qualité de l'information accessible au Canada. Et ça, ça veut dire qu'on affecte fortement euh, la démocratie canadienne. Et donc, dans ce sens-là, c'est quoi la limite à ce que les actionnaires peuvent faire comme profit, comme sous, comme revenu, quand le prix à payer, c'est au niveau des emplois de qualité et c'est au niveau de la démocratie canadienne. Et la plupart des emplois qui coupent, notamment au niveau des, des, des soutiens administratifs, ce n'est pas des emplois qui disparaissent. C'est des emplois qui sont transférés à l'étranger, qui sont transférés en Turquie, euh, en Afrique du Nord, dans des endroits qui, malheureusement, offrent des conditions de travail, des conditions de salaire bien en deçà des, des standards canadiens. Et donc, encore une fois, c'est une façon sur le dos des, des individus d'agrandir de, l'enrichissement des actionnaires. Bien, il est le temps que le gouvernement prenne acte de ça. Il est, il est le temps qu'on pose les questions qui s'imposent à Bell, qui justifient les actions qu'ils prennent. Et en fonction des réponses qui seront obtenues, notamment celles de l'enrichissement éhonté des actionnaires, bien, il est peut-être le temps qu'on serre la vis. Euh, donc, c'est clair pour Unifor, euh, c'est un combat qu'on va continuer de mener au nom de nos membres, mais pas seulement au nom de nos membres, au nom de l'ensemble des Canadiennes et des Canadiens qui ont le droit à une démocratie en santé avec des nouvelles de qualité. Merci tout le monde et je passerai la parole à Kevin Newman. Thank you, Danielle and Lana. You'll have to excuse me, I have that winter cold. <coughs> I was um, encouraged to come today by some former and current uh, employees of Bell Media who are unable to speak up or are contractually obligated not to. Uh, but they wanted Canadians to hear their concern that the constant news cuts are now to the bone. And it's at a time when verified fact-based reporting is under severe strain from external forces and their own company. First, let's talk about the outside threats. Canada's security agencies have been warning for some time that the number one threat to this country is cyber threat actors attempting to influence Canadians and degrade trust. The CSE added last month, disinformation has become ubiquitous and adversaries are now using generative artificial intelligence to create and spread fake news. NATO calls this cognitive warfare. It is aimed 
at Canadian families to try to get into their heads, influence our decisions, and undermine our truth. Yet at the same time that these misinformation campaigns are being supercharged by AI, the largest and most profitable media company in Canada has chosen this moment to drastically shrink the leading antidote to cognitive warfare. That's verified journalism, and it's number one source for it in Canada, CTV and Bell Radio News. You know, this is about more than journalists losing their jobs. This is about the safety and security of Canadians that we are only barely aware of and already surrendering to. This weekend, after 58 seasons, the show that I was proud to be a part of before I retire, W5, will air its final long-form investigative report. It's worth remembering that W5 began in 1966, and that was a time when CTV was on the verge of bankruptcy. But even then, it took on the powerful, governments, politicians, corporations, criminals. W5 survived every change in ownership. It survived intimidation tactics. It survived uh, multiple threatened lawsuits. It even survived the toughest time slot in Canadian television against Hockey Night in Canada. But in the end, what it could not survive was the premier focus of its current leadership, which is maximizing shareholder value, share price, and capital return. Excuse me. <clears throat> With the world rapidly destabilizing and becoming much more dangerous, Bell Media has chosen now to close all of its international news bureaus. With climate change, uh, sorry, news bureaus outside of North America. With climate change and cyber attacks becoming more commonplace in our communities across the country, Bell Media has chosen now to eliminate most of its street radio reporters. Bell Media has chosen now to leave many of their local TV newsrooms abandoned on weekends. It's reduced the number of employees covering national news in each province outside of Ontario to one person, one. And Bell Media continues to eliminate the most experienced journalists and anchors that Canadians had learned to trust. All of these decisions risk making Canadians less able to combat cognitive warfare with verified facts and credible reporting. We are opening the door even wider to misinformation and manipulation, which further polarizes Canadians and reduces our country's resilience to this new kind of hybrid warfare. Take another sip. <clears throat> now, Bell's leadership has said in statements that it believes the business model for national news needs to evolve. And I have to tell you that everybody who's spoken to me agrees with that wholeheartedly. There must be more innovation, more experimentation, so that we can connect to Canadians and find new ways of funding real journalism. What no one has seen over the recent years, they tell me, is any attempt at that, aside from cutting newsrooms year after year and telling those that remain they must do much more with much less. And it's important to remember, as Lana said, Bell Media still earns a little under a quarter in profit for every dollar, and its parent company twice that from its wireless and its fiber divisions. It has improved its dividend to shareholders every year for the past 16 years, and there are very few companies on the Toronto Stock Exchange who do that. In one of those annual reports, Bell proudly claims to be advancing how Canadians connect with each other and the world. But Bell's commitment to the quality of that connection is not advancing. By slashing its newsrooms year after year, it is leading an information retreat among all broadcasters. It's creating TV and radio news deserts where there are few, if any, private sector journalists. Canadians are left to ask, where do we find the truth now? Well, it is my personal opinion that this profitable company, which has been granted stewardship of Canada's number one news source by federal regulators, should acknowledge this new and current threat of psychological 
information warfare in reverse course. Invest in its newsrooms, sustain W5, and try some new ideas to fund journalism. To keep cutting the Bell Division to, that supports the pursuit of truth amounts to capitulation to those adversaries who are trying to undermine our trust in truth, in one another, and in our peaceful society. This is the time to fortify our information defenses, not tear them down. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kevin. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> we have people in the room. <laughs> part of uh, a lot of people out there who say, oh, can't have more really for government funding. What can be done outside of it? Well, I think that there are things that governments can do, and they have been doing some of them, either through regulation, either through support, direct support. Um, some of the, the new initiatives around supporting journalism directly, uh, you know, labor uh, credits to, to hire journalists, all of those things are important. And it's important that no matter the government of the day, that they continue uh, to do this in many, many ways. But also, you know, producing news is, is a privilege in this country. It's particularly a privilege when you've been granted uh, broadcast rights to be able to do it. And I think we have to put this in perspective. These companies are still making a lot of money. Bell Canada, BCE, they make a lot of money. They have a responsibility, a responsibility to deliver high quality news to Canadians. And that means investing in those newsrooms, as Kevin has pointed out, and, and not thinking that just because every single thing out there doesn't make them a ton of money that they stop doing it. That is, that is not the social contract that they signed up to. And, uh, and we expect more of them. And by the way, I would say to Bell and BCE, read the room in this country right now. People are angry at corporations who continue to do this, optimize shareholder profit without investing in the services that they promised to deliver to Canadians. And we're gonna be calling them out for it. And we expect Canadians to call them out for it and continue to demand that they are accountable for their actions and their decisions, and that we continue to push them to invest in local news in this country. Yes, absolutely. I think maybe in French as well, Hunter. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really want to comment on, on government support of journalists because that's not, that's not what, um, what Bell Media does. I mean, Bell Media has, has taken some support during um, uh, the COVID like many companies did, but this is, this is private sector journalism. And it, it's possible and it's necessary. We, we can't just um, um, have only one news source in this country that is the public sector at the CBC. Uh, private sector journalism has been around for 50 years. And I mentioned W5, you know, it began in an era when, um, uh, when you know, the private sector company was near bankruptcy and yet they were still committed to bringing investigative journalism. And that's not the case today. I mean, this is a company that is uh, making considerable amount of profit and its commitment to that kind of deep investigation has been withdrawn. And um, so, um, you know, uh, we, we, we need to make sure that the companies that are given um, custodianship over um, the news that Canadians get uh, in the private sector um, understand, as, as Lana said, that um, there is a social contract and that they, um, you know, uh, the way that they look at um, other divisions, the 40% profit margin they get on wireless, for instance, is not something that necessarily applies to um, something like journalism. Une des questions, c'est de savoir uh, à qui appartient la responsabilité de produire les nouvelles. Est-ce que c'est une responsabilité qui appartient à l'État ou est-ce qu'il y a l'entreprise privée qui doit le faire? Euh, donc, la question, est-ce que le gouvernement peut aider? Oui. Est-ce qu'il y a des façons de le faire? Oui. Euh, 
Euh, Est-ce qu'ils peuvent le faire, par exemple, en subventionnant directement des journalistes, en donnant des crédits à l'embauche de journalistes? Euh, donc, il y a différentes façons. Mais reste qu'il y a un investissement privé nécessaire et il y a une rentabilité privée à la clé de tout ça. Donc, il y a une très grosse responsabilité qui provient de ces entreprises privées-là qui génèrent des profits tout en accomplissant leur devoir de produire des nouvelles de qualité. Maintenant, euh, on comprend tout qu'il y a un bouleversement au niveau de la livraison des nouvelles comme telles. Euh, mais il faut faire une, une distinction entre le médium qui livre la nouvelle et le journaliste qui produit la nouvelle. Et en ce moment, ben, il semble, Belle ne semble pas faire de différence entre les deux. Elle sabre littéralement au niveau des journalistes qui produit la nouvelle. Euh, et, 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 et donc, il faut leur rappeler le, leurs obligations, leurs devoirs aussi envers les Canadiens. Le, le Canada a toujours offert à ces compagnies-là un environnement d'affaires qui leur permettait de tirer des gros profits, qui leur a toujours permis aussi d'assurer la croissance et la rentabilité de leur entreprise. Et encore aujourd'hui, cet environnement d'affaires-là existe. Fait que, oui, le gouvernement peut aider, mais en même temps, il est temps qu'on arrête de subir le chantage de ces entreprises-là. Euh, la décision de couper 4 800 postes, par exemple, est-ce que c'est en réaction avec la décision du CRTC des forcer euh, de partager le réseau, le réseau qu'on a payé en grande partie? Euh, et, et donc, c'est un peu à ça qu'on assiste aussi. Euh, donc, la bonne question, ce n'est pas de quelle manière le gouvernement peut continuer de soutenir, c'est de quel, quel engagement ces compagnies-là doivent prendre pour eux-mêmes continuer de soutenir les nouvelles, soutenir les moyens de les diffuser et soutenir euh, la technologie nécessaire pour les diffuser. Maintenant, ben, c'est vrai qu'on n'a pas vu de tant d'innovation que ça, dans le sens que tout ce qu'on assiste depuis des années, c'est des compagnies qui braillent que l'environnement et que le gouvernement euh, fait en sorte que ce n'est pas facile pour eux autres de faire des affaires pendant qu'ils coupent et qu'ils coupent et qu'ils coupent et qu'ils coupent. On n'a pas vu de, de, de façon d'essayer de réinventer qu'il y a un journaliste qui produit de la nouvelle et que là, on le diffuse de façon, euh, disons, moderne ou euh, de différentes façons qui va permettre à cette nouvelle-là de se rendre aux Canadiens. Là, on est en train de vous parler d'une situation où on transfère les jobs à l'étranger et et on coupe littéralement les nouvelles et les journalistes. Thanks, Danielle. I would just point out as well, and I'd ask, you know, Canadians to think about all of the challenges that we face today. And in particular, we've had any number of climate challenges in our community. Not that long ago, Atlantic Canada was hit by a hurricane and many, many storms. And in, in the result of that, It was journalists who made sure that we had the information we needed to keep ourselves safe and to report every single day what was happening. And it was our members on the telecommunications side who fixed all the infrastructure that was broken as a result and was damaged and gutted as a result of those, of those weather catastrophes. And we're going to have more of them. We, we need journalists. We need telecommunication workers to connect this country. Uh, now more than ever, by the way, given the polarization that is occurring. So we need to think about the very important work that these people do every day to help us in our daily lives and to keep us safe. So thanks very much.